In today's episode, we look at how nine men split into two teams to carry out near simultaneous shootings and the connection to the one that got away from the raid at the Security House Depot robbery. Kindy Patterson, who was believed to be the policeman at the raid, is believed to escape with his share of the loot to the Caribbean, with police not having enough evidence to extradite him back. But let's go back just over a year before the 2006 Tunbridge Security House raid to October 2004, where two gang hits killing two men and injuring others would bring Key Andy Patterson's name to the police trident team. It's a police case where no witnesses would talk. He had been accused of being part of a gang who were responsible for horrific nights of violence. A six million pound court case would see this gang brought to trial. Two police forces squabbling over evidence and a shocking conclusion, which has a twist greater than the TV show, The Twilight Zone. Like nightclub in West Croydon, Mark Warmington had agreed to provide security backup at the club in London Road. At 3.10 a.m., a person all in black with a hooded top turned and fired a number of shots into the dance floor area, hitting Rufus Edwards. People started screaming, running about, scrambling and shouting, murder, he's dead. Mark Wilmington had grabbed one of the assailants and in the struggle he was shot at the front door. The three assailants blended in with the crowd as they ran out with hundreds of revellers at the nightclub. When the nightclub cleared, two men were dead Mark Wilmington was dead, shot at point blank range. Also dead was his friend, Rufus Edwards. Michael Edwards was also gunned down, but survived after a liver transplant. After police investigations, it turned out that Rufus Edwards had loaned £25,000 to enable a man called Chippy to buy a kilogram of cocaine. A dispute arose when Mr Edwards wanted the money back because he felt the cocaine bought was poor quality. Some six weeks before Mark Warmington was shot dead, it turned out that he was an IT consultant and managing security at the club was his new business venture. It was his third week. After the shooting in Croydon, an hour later, a second incident involving a drive-by shooting of two young women in Bristol. The pair had accepted a lift off Curtis Brooks, thought by police to have been intended target of the attack. Former school friends Donna Small, who was 25 years old, and Asha Jammer, who was 22, had met by chance in a nightclub in Bristol. Donna Small and Asha Jammer were the victims when a submachine gun was fired at close range into the open top Saab they were passengers in. Donna Small suffering a fractured skull and head injuries, and Asha Jammer being blind in her left eye and suffering facial disfigurement. As the silver Saab convertible drove out of Bristol with its top down, a BMW pulled up alongside and a gunman sprayed the car with machine gun fire. Twelve bullets ripped through the metal bodywork in under three quarters of a second. The three men, believed to be the target of the shooting, escaped unarmed. The intended targets, Curtis Brooks and Andrew Joseph, who were giving the women a lift home, escaped virtually uninjured. The two women were casually left for dead, their bodies slumped in the bloody debris, splintered by glassy shrapnel. Later, one of the men returned and drove the car to a police station, dumping them before fleeing the scene. It was a brutal gangland hit, it was, the police said afterwards, simply a case of being in the wrong place, at the wrong time. There was no reason why. Donna Small was shot in the head and suffered a fractured skull and had to learn to walk again. Asher Jam was blind in her left eye and suffered facial disfigurement. Asher's experience is particularly a horrific example of what happens to the innocent victims who find themselves entangled in the all-pervading criminality of modern-day Britain. Here was a young woman who was dragged into a bloody feud that had nothing to do with her, left for dead in the back of a car by the men who tried to kill her. 
After the shootings, nine men were arrested. A warrant was put out for Kindy Patterson, but that was later dropped. And the reason why, we will cover in a moment. The police prosecution told the courts, in a coordinated plan to kill, a plan between the defendants, Darren Little, Marcus Anderson, Michael Lindo, and Everett Bell, who has not been apprehended. These were not independent or coincidental. It had been alleged that all nine men worked together as a team of assassins, linked to both shootings by a trail of mobile phone calls, according to the police. Derek Mason and Michael Nettleford participated in the Croydon Enterprise, and Craig Hughes, Daniel Valentine, Winston Minot, and Cleveland Fenderson participated in the Bristol Enterprise. Father of three, Rufus Edwards, who was 34 years old, of Croydon, was executed on the dance floor at the London Road nightclub. Spotlight doorman, 39 year old Mark Warmington from Streatham, was also shot dead in the same incident by the two gunmen. Police linked the two murders and the attempted murder in Croydon to the shootings in Bristol. Phone records of the alleged gang members showed all men were in contact throughout the night with each other. The Metropolitan's Police Black on Black Gun Crime Unit, Operation Trident, got involved and the paperwork spiralled. Tensions are believed to have developed between the two forces. Speaking off the record, one officer from Avon and Somerset accused the Metropolitan Police of shoddy and unprofessional work. A spokesman from the Met, meanwhile, insisted their investigation had been meticulous. In the end, nine men, two from Bristol, seven from Greater London, and ranging in ages from 20 to 34 years old, were put on trial simultaneously for murder and conspiracy to murder. It had been alleged that all nine men were working together as a team of assassins, linked to both the shootings by a trail and mobile phone calls. After more than a week of deliberation by the jury, all nine men were cleared. One of the lawyers involved in the case points out the problems of putting all nine men on trial at once, resulting in a torturous five-month process, costing £6 million. Two trials would have made more sense, says the lawyer. They'll be held to pay at the CPS. This isn't the first time they have mounted an unwieldy and unworkable murder prosecution. So we go back to Kindy Patterson. By the time the police managed to get an arrest warrant out for him, the suspect was nowhere to be found. As a last resort, law enforcement officers brought in his brother, Teo, for questioning, but even that led to a dead end. Police had no DNA evidence on Kindy Patterson. But what would cause major problems for the police? The shocking thing was almost a cinematic reveal. Kindy and Teo were identical twins. With little evidence, if anyone picked him out of a lineup, his defence could destroy the whole case, saying which brother was it. The case was dropped against Kindy, and the police proceeded with the other nine men. In 2006, two days after the security house robbery, the case against Kindy Patterson and the court case of the nine men double hit collapsed. Kindy Patterson, identified by police as the one that got away, and the raid addressed as a policeman, appears to have been missing since 2006, with his share of the loot. And most people assume he has fled England. In fact, the police of several reports believe that he is currently hiding somewhere in the West Indies, as his family originally hails from the Caribbean region. Still with no official confirmation of such a development, Kindy Patterson's current whereabouts are a mystery and he remains a wanted fugitive in the United Kingdom. <laughs>